there are three goals we would like to accomplish for this uh, lecture. This uh, is also the second half of uh, chapter 11. First, we would like to introduce stern lovely problems. We're going to demonstrate the two special equation we have seen before, Legenda and the Basel, are actually special cases of standard lift problem. And we're going to demonstrate how to solve the standard lift problems. Its solution is going to involve a group of eigenvalues and a group of eigenfunctions. And uh, the eigenfunctions is collectively have an orthogonality, which is a cornerstone of many applications, including the Fourier series representation uh, we discussed last time. And uh, we're going to use the same property to demonstrate we can demonstrate, we can represent a function with a range of x extended to infinity can be done with a Fourier integral representation. And um, uh, then we're going to discuss the special cases of uh, Fourier integral representations. Stendhalville problem has uh, a few characteristics in its definition. The first term of this equation uh, involves the derivative of a product involving a function times the first of the derivative of y. So if we expand it, the first term, we're going to have second order derivative times p plus y, uh, p prime times y prime. Um, so it is a second order ODE. If we look at the second term in the Stan Lovely definition, it involves a function q and a function r of x. r of x is also called weight function. We're going to discuss later on, which plays a, a more important role than p and q. Uh, it's called the weight function. And the uh, lambda is a unspecified constant we call the eigenvalues. In order to solve this standard problem, lambda is not given at its outset, but we will find that we can find the solution y only for a given set of lambda. So th this set collectively called eigenvalue set, the solution y is uh, going to call eigenfunction set. A standardly problem usually involves two, pro uh, two boundary conditions specified at the two points of x. At each point, it will involve uh, y and the y prime, linear combination of y and the y prime. They don't necessarily uh, have all these four terms, but uh, some of this have to be non-zero. Uh, so, this is also why stern lovely problems and Hermes is called boundary value problems. 
or eigenvalue eigenfunction problems. If uh, we look at the, uh, this problem, this is uh, probably the simplest stern lovely problem. Y prime plus lambda y equal to zero with two boundary conditions. Y at one is at x equal to zero, one is at the y, uh, x equal to pi. Um, lambda is unspecified at its outset. We have to find it. And uh, obviously this is a standardly problem with uh, p equal to one, q equal to zero, and r equal to one also. And uh, this equation arises when we solve PDE by separation variables. We shall see in the next chapter, solving a PDE reduce the PDE into a set of ordinary differential equations. And uh, this equation arises when we solve the vibrate, vibrating stream problems. In order to see the solution of this equation, I solved uh, on two pieces of paper, and they are uh, relate to something we discussed in chapter two. In order to solve this equation, we recognize it's a second order ODE. So we can use the characteristic equation to solve it. Even lambda is not specified, uh, the characteristic equation can be written in this way. After rearrangement, we can say m squared equal to minus lambda. And based on what we discuss in chapter two, we know lambda can have negative, positive, or zero, three situations. And uh, the solution of the given equation depend on the nature of lambda. And we have to discuss three different cases. First, let's look at the case when lambda is smaller than zero. The two roots of the characteristic equation can be written as positive, negative, square root of minus lambda. The way I write it is by looking at as a speci a specific number like uh, if lambda equal to negative two, then m equal to positive two, then the two roots of the characteristic equation is going to be positive, negative, square root of negative lambda. Uh, negative lambda is two. If lambda is negative two. Um, the other way of looking at it is the roots of this equation always involve two values with the opposite sign. And uh, then we look at how to write the, uh, the next factor. It involves square root of something, but inside the square root, it always has to be a positive quantity. We put a positive quantity like uh, negative lambda. Uh, so uh, make sure you can write this line if we recognize the two roots of what we stipulate, then we can write the solution of this given differential equation like this. This is what we learned in chapter two. Then we can apply the first boundary condition in there. We found C2 equal to negative C1. 
then apply the second boundary condition and uh, what we already found between the C1 value and the C2 value in this equation, we get this line. Then we can rearrange, move this turn to the right, take log, eliminate the common terms. We get this interesting relation. In order to have a positive value equal to negative value, we have lambda value equal to zero. The only lambda value which satisfies this equation is lambda equal to zero. Uh, so if lambda equal to zero, we have a trivial solution. It's not desirable. So we're not gonna have a case one problem. Actually, lambda equal to zero contradict to our assumption. Therefore, the other way of looking at it, this is lambda cannot be negative value. So we have to look at two other cases. The second case involves lambda equal to zero. So the two roots can be written as simply positive, negative, zero. And uh, we can integrate uh, the original given equation reduces to y double prime equal to zero because lambda equal to zero. The second term in the given equation doesn't exist. Integrating this equation two times, we get this linear equation and uh, then apply the boundary condition to this equation, we found that two constants are zero. So again, we have a trivial solution, which is not what we wanted. So we have to go to the case three. Case three says um, lambda is positive. If lambda is positive, we know the right-hand side of the characteristic equation is smaller than zero. So uh, for a negative value on the right, we can write the two roots, which involve imaginary i. And uh, the two roots always have two values with uh, two opposite signs. So we put a positive negative sign there. Then in the middle, we put the square root of lambda because lambda is positive. Um, if uh, you have trouble um, writing these uh, two roots, one suggestion is consider lambda equal to two. So the right-hand side is a negative two. So we can write the two roots like positive, negative, square root of two times i. Then in the such conditions, if we have imaginary number for the two roots of the characteristic equation, as we learned from chapter two, the solution of y can be written like this which involve cosine and the sine terms. And then we apply the boundary condition at x equals zero. We found a uh, equals zero. When we apply the second boundary condition in, we have sine evaluated square root of lambda times pi equal to zero. This is the equation which allow us to find lambda. What can be the lambda values? We say the square root of lambda times pi 
has to be either zero, positive, negative one, positive, negative two, etc. So we say um, square root of lambda n equal to n, which is uh, collectively a group of numbers. Lambda is our eigenvalues. And uh, eigenfunctions will be the solution of the given problem. We already know a is zero, so the first term doesn't exist. We have a second term uh, as the eigenfunctions or the solution of the given problem. Um, the eigenvalue lambda n, n equal to n squared. Notice here, I did not include n equal to zero or negative integers in the group. The reasons are, first, when n equal to zero, sine zero is zero. So again, this is a trivial element for sine zero. So we don't have to include sine zero in there. It's zero, essentially. For negative n, we have this relation, sine of a negative value equal to sine a positive value is an even function. Sine is an even function. So we should not include both of them in the eigen function set because they are so-called linearly dependent. This complete the uh, solution of a simple eigenvalue eigenfunction problem. And uh, let's move on and uh, define the orthogonality. This is a very uh, long definition um, for a given set of functions within a certain range. A group of eigen functions, a group of functions within this integral is called orthogonal with weight function R is because it has this property. The integral of R times ym yn equal to zero if uh, ym and ym are two different element in the group of functions. And uh, this R is called weight functions. And uh, we can also define the norm for uh, two identical element in the integral. If uh, we choose to integrate two identical element in the orthogonal set of function with uh, its weight, we have a non-zero value. And uh, the norm is defined as the square root of this integral. This is how orthogonality and the norm are defined for a group of functions. And we are going to say later on that for an orthogonal um, set of functions, uh, it has this property and the stern Louvre problems actually all have this orthogonal orthogonality. Then on this slide, we define the term 
also normal if uh, a group of functions can be called also normal on this range if it is orthogonal this is the primary condition it has to be orthogonal before we can say it's also normal uh, if the norm is one then we can write what we just said in this short line um, the integral of uh, two elements in the set and uh, the weight function equal to either zero or one depending on if we are integrating with respect to different element or identical element uh, and then notice if uh, we are integrating two identical element and we get uh, the norm equal to one then it's called also normal uh, also normal is associated with this value one if we integrate two different elements we still get zero um, so uh, we have to familiarize with uh, the notations like the norm is uh, designated by uh, this notation with two bars on each side uh, this integral can be lengthy so we give a shorthand uh, with a parenthesis on both sides um, um, then the other thing I want to say is uh, the norm is associated with a particular element and each element may have its own norm which may be different and uh, then uh, we shall see an example uh, this is a a group of functions um, we saw we called the Fourier series last time in the interval of x from negative pi to pi um, this group of function about y cosine nx and the sine x um, we claim this group of functions is uh, also going to set of functions we're going to prove it um, and that in order to prove it I, before i prove it i want to say one thing in the study guide from page 83 to 87 there are two complete examples i saw by hand uh, you should refer to, uh, the study guide for this kind of exercise you should be you should familiarize your exercise this kind of exercise uh, very important and here i'm going to demonstrate only one example um, it involved two pages this is actually a group of functions we call fourier series of uh, and we want to demonstrate the orthogonality over this range of x this is the other way of writing it and uh, first uh, how many integrals we have to take before we can demonstrate the orthogonality let's look at this way we have to take different elements inside the integrals that may be 
one with cosine, one with sine. That's two of them. And uh, we ha also have uh, integrals involve sine and the cosine, two different elements. So this has altogether three already. Three different types of integrals involve two different elements of the functions in this set. Then we have to choose identical functions that involve one, cosine and x squared, sine and x squared. So all together, are you convinced we're gonna have six integrals we have to take? Um, so the, here are one, two, three, four, five, six integrals we have to take. First, take two different elements in the integrals. One cosine, one sine, cosine, sine. Um, um, so, um, in some situation, in, we have to pay attention that uh, you may encounter m minus n inside the integral in the denominator. <coughs> if this situation happened, we have to split the discussion by saying this line is only for m not equal to m. And then we have to write a second line based on m equal to m. In this case, sine zero as the integral integrand, then we integrate uh, zero. So be aware uh, of this type of uh, analysis will be needed in your solution. Then we integrate identical element cosine cosine. Again, we have m minus n in the denominator can happen. This can happen all the time. Then we have to split into two situations. And uh, uh, then after we integrate uh, this six integrals, we found is indeed orthogonal set of functions. You see we have zero, zero, zero here, non-zero here, where m equal to n, non-zero for m equal to n, etc. And uh, by the definition of norm, we look at uh, this number. Do you agree? For the element one in the orthogonal set of function, the norm is a square root of two pi. For the sine element, we have the norm equal to the square root of pi. Similarly, for this result, we have uh, known equal to the square root of pi. And uh, here I want to relate the definition of also normality with the result we just got. When we define an also normal set of functions, we look at the norms we already obtained. Are you convinced if we divide every element by its norm, we are going to get also a normal set of functions? Uh, the reason is when we integrate one times one, for example, we're going to get two pi. So uh, this will cancel out with 
two pi um, inside the denominator. So we have an orthonormal set of functions. Um, so we can, the other way of saying it is so we can make this given set of function also normal by dividing every element by its norm. Now here is the theory I mentioned briefly at the outset uh, for any Stanley problem. It's a solution, or we can call it also uh, the Agang um, functional set of functions. This set of function will have orthogonality. This is a theory uh, beyond our scope of discussion for its proof. Um, but uh, this is a very important conclusion. Uh, integrating two elements in the icon uh, function set with the R of X in the stern lovely problem, we always have either zero or non-zero, depending on if uh, M equal to M. Uh, this will have significant application to what we're gonna discuss later on, but the proof is beyond our discussion. Now this is a problem we already discussed. Uh, here I do want to mention one thing. We are paving the way for the discussion of uh, solution of partial differential equations. Um, all the uh, partial differential equation we are going to discuss will be Eigen value eigen function will involve eigen value eigen functions, and uh, this is a special type of Stern-Lovely problem, which is associated with a rectangular coordinate. Um, so we see p equal to one, q equal to zero, or equal to one for the formal definition of stern lovely problem. If we have this, we reduce the problem to this. And uh, if you are interested in knowing where, what kind of problem will generate this equation, we can tell you it comes from the vibrating stream problem, which we will discuss in chapter 12. Uh, in uh, the discussion of uh, partial differential equation, we are going to see a solution can be separated into two parts. And one part will result in this type of problem. And here, we uh, discuss the Legender equation. We already know the Legender equation has constant in there. This is a Legender equation we discussed earlier. You can tell from the first two terms, we can condense the equation to this Stern-Lovely problem. So it is a Stern-Lovely problem with p equal to one minus x squared q equal to zero or equal to one. So uh, we already demonstrate a given uh, uh, Legender equation is a sp special case of Stern-Lovely problem. Um, and uh, because for integer n's, we are going to have 
the solution like this, PM. La gender polynomial is the solution of this equation, which we demonstrate in chapter five. And the range of interest is between negative one to one of x. So uh, since r of x equal to one, the weight is one. So we can say this important line based on the theory we discussed on the last slide. We claim the integral of two different elements in this uh, group of functions, the gender polynomial functions has to be zero. This can be easily proved. If uh, you choose uh, two different elements, integrate, you can demonstrate this easily. Particularly if you are using MathCAD, I urge you to demonstrate uh, in chapter five, we already defined what are the legendary polynomial. Uh, so this can be easily proven. Now we are going to talk about um, uh, more cases like uh, Bessel functions also fall into this category and how we can uh, generalize the discussion of Fourier series into Fourier integrals. Now, uh, here is a summary of uh, uh, what we have discussed and what we are going to discuss associated with Bessel. Uh, this is a situation we discussed. If uh, this fall into the definition of stern lively problem um, with these uh, three functions. Uh, if we convert it to stern lively problem, and here are the solutions. And we just discuss for a given uh, legendary equation, we can convert to eigenvalue, eigenfunction problems, uh, or standardly problems like this, with uh, the function in the definition like this. Notice the weight for the Legendary polynomial is one. It's because in this form, R is one. In this specific form, R is one. Um, then the eigenvalue set is this, and the eigenfunction, which was already uh, discussed, we're going to see a gen, uh, we already derived it in the, on the last slide. Um, then for the basal, if a basal look like this, we can transform the coordinate like this, we can get this equation, which is a stern lively problem with p equal to x, q equal to negative n squared divided by x. This is q. And uh, the weight function r is x. Uh, so the um, eigenvalue, eigenfunction for this problem is going to be a little bit more involved. In, on the next slide, I'm going to show how to solve this equation um, to demonstrate Bessel function associated with uh, cylindrical coordinate can involve solution, which are uh, functions. Uh, so this is a summary, which says 
the Stan Lively province, uh, so she was Cartesian coordinate, uh, so she was spherical coordinate or cylindrical coordinate, or can be considered eigenvalue eigenfunction problems. And uh, their solutions are in the uh, Eigen functions set. We can derive those. And uh, this is a, a illustration how the Bessel equations generate Bessel functions, and the Bessel functions forms an orthogonal set of functions. Also, we can call Eigen functions. Let's start with uh, this simple equation. It doesn't look like Bessel, but we can convert to Bessel. Uh, the dependent variable is, uh, the independent variable is R. Uh, please be careful, we have two R's in this uh, section of discussion. In this equation, R represent the independent variable associated with cylindrical coordinate. And again, this equation can be derived based on a partial differential equation involving cylindrical coordinate, which we will see in the next chapter. This R and this R are independent variables. <coughs> and uh, we will see this equation when we saw PDE associated with cylindrical coordinate. And uh, if we see this equation, we can use this transformation formula. We get this equation, then we recognize this is a Bessel equation. Um, and the solution uh, is Bessel functions. Since this equation is a Bessel equation uh, of order zero, notice nu is zero, it doesn't have the, the, the constant term in the last term of this Bessel equation. So the solution involved Bessel uh, functions of first kind of order zero. And uh, like we discussed last time, it has to be Bessel function to Bessel function of first kind and second kind. Second kind has to be involved because it's an integer. The order is an integer. So if we write in the original independent variable form, we get this expression. Um, then when we apply the boundary condition M to solve the uh, constant in this solution, we found uh, Y zero, we already know it approach negative infinity when r equal to zero. When r equal to zero, y now approach negative infinity, so this term cannot exist because all the problem we involve should have trivial, non-trivial solutions. Um, this term is a lot. So we're gonna have Bessel function of first kind of order zero as the solution. If the cylindrical object has a uh, radius equal to capital R. Notice the capital R represent the radius, radius of the cylindrical ordinate, uh, ordinate. So we have k times r equal to zero as the boundary condition. 
um, if uh, the boundary is set at the zero, we have this. And mathematically speaking, let's see what it means. Vessel function of the first kind of order zero evaluate at this values equal to zero. We already know Bessel function of first kind of order zero is oscillating function starting from one. Uh, and it oscillate, so it has zeros, this point passing through the all axis we call zeros. So we have these zeros we designate by alpha with subscript, with two subscripts. The first one designate the order of the Bessel function, which is zero. And uh, the second subscript designate that this alpha value correspond the first zero of this special function. So you can tell the second zero is designated by alpha zero two, third one alpha zero three, etc. So collectively, K times capital R can be alpha zero M can be any M, M correspond to positive integers. So the eigenvalues are K sub zero M or alpha zero M divided by capital R. And then notice Alpha is uh, the radius of a given cylindrical object, which has to be given. And the alpha values are the zeros of a Bessel function. These numbers are known values. When we are given a Bessel function of first kind, all these alpha values or the zeros are tabulated in books or in the computer software. So the right hand side should be fully given numbers. And the, the eigenfunction associated with this problem, uh, uh, J, Bessel functions. So we can say, Bessel functions. Notice this low case R is the independent variable of this given problem. It's not the uh, weight function of the stern Lovely problem. Uh, but I do want to caution you uh, for a stern Lovely problem for a cylindrical object, we have a weight function equal to R also. The reason is, uh, let's uh, look at the, uh, the stern lovely problem we discuss here. That if uh, R is an independent variable, the weight function is R. Here, if we represent the independent variable as uh, x, we have the wave function equal to uh, x. If we use the cylindrical coordinate, we have this term, this factor b r. So the weight function is r. I want to make this point clear to everyone. This is what I said, I just said. Um, now, um, this is a summary of what, what we discussed in the last lecture. 
if we want to represent a periodic function by an orthogonal set of functions, if f is given, we want to represent by an orthogonal set of functions, we can represent in this way. And uh, then, um, if uh, the orthogonal set of function have knowns equal to this notation, then we can say the the coefficient can be obtained by this formula. This is a very important result uh, which apply to not only what we discussed for Cartesian coordinate, this formula also apply to Legenda equations, Legenda polynomials, or Legenda uh, or Bessel functions. So for Legenda equations from Legenda equation, Legenda functions, Legenda polynomial from Legenda equations, we can represent any given function by Legenda polynomials with uh, the uh, polynomials are already fully determined, fully given, which you can find from chapter five, which is a tabulated on page 178. Uh, please look at that page, it's important. Legenda polynomials are listed. And uh, this coefficient, based on what we discussed on the last slide, can be shortened in this format. So if we want to represent a given function, we simply need to use this formula to get all the coefficients. F is given, polynomial is given, so we can integrate. Uh, and that the norm can also be given by putting two Legenda polynomial inside the integral, we get the norm equal to this. So this is relatively uh, simple. Uh, in the homework exercise, you will see several homework problems involve the use of these two equations. Uh, another point I want to make is I urge students to use MathCAD. With MathCAD, you can get these integrals very easily. Next, uh, we discuss Bessel. We already know the Bessel equation is a standard Therefore, the Bessel functions forms an orthogonal set of functions with a weight equal to R. Uh, this is uh, uh, being demonstrated and uh, based on the theory, we said this has to be orthogonal set of functions. Therefore, if we are given a function f. We can represent a function based on this orthogonal set of Bessel functions. First, uh, uh, we demonstrate this uh, given Bessel equation can be transformed to a stern lovely problem. I'm going to skip the detail because it's a relatively straightforward. Uh, you can transform the coordinate and then, uh, but here it does involve the derivative of Bessel 
we didn't emphasize this, um, but it's shown in the slide of my last presentation. Um, then we find the transformed equation is a standard value problem with well-defined function. And then notice here, this is what I am, want to emphasize, the weight function is simply the independent variable of the given functions, it's an x. Um, so based on this theory of Stanley problem, we mentioned that uh, this orthogonal set of functions, uh, these special functions are to be orthogonal. Uh, so it has this form uh, with these weight functions. And uh, this, uh, this k represent the eigenvalues. They are simply the zeros of special function of order n and uh, this is the n's, n's uh, zero of uh, Bessel function of order n divided by capital R. That's what uh, k is defined. There's this stipulate orthogonality of uh, Bessel functions. And uh, we can also demonstrate, but we're not going to prove it. It's um, uh, beyond the scope of uh, this course. The norm, if we want to represent, if we want to represent a given function f by Bessel, then the coefficient of this representation can be obtained based on this equation. Well, integrating this equation can be very troublesome. Uh, so we're now gonna discuss this. And uh, this equation shows how we get the norm of uh, the Bessel functions. Uh, so make sure you no, these things exist. And then we are ready to discuss if we want to represent a given function like one minus x squared. We know the known, and uh, not the known, the coefficient of Fourier, uh, the representation can be obtained based on this previous slide, uh, and that the integration does involve uh, the derivative of Bessel functions, which is a little bit troublesome. And then uh, we can get this, and the finally we can get a representation like this. Uh, I just want to show you this uh, exist, but in the next set of homework, we are now going to trouble you with uh, the Bessel functions, Bessel representation of a given function like this. Um, but we have in homework exercise involve legendar polynomials. The last subject of this chapter involves representation of a given function, which is not periodic, but the range of interest of x is extended to infinity. And uh, let's start with this periodic function as an example first. If we have a periodic function uh, within negative L to L of X, we have 
this uh, definition of this periodic function. The period is greater than 2L and it's represented in this, this form, the first form. If period is 4, L equal to 2, we have this representation. It will re repeat itself from here to here, from here to here, from here to here. And then if we double the period, the function looks like this. If we double the period again, we have this period look like this. And then if uh, we look at the series, the uh, representation, if we use Fourier series to represent the given function, we can obtain the Fourier coefficient like this. Then uh, if we represent the Fourier coefficient one at a time as a function of m pi over L, so these are integer values for this graph, m pi over L. So this represent A now, this represent A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, etc. And when we double, double the period, we get A n look like this. Notice that A n will appear more frequently within this envelope. And that the magnitude is reduced by half. And uh, then if we further double the period, we see this uh, co-option happened more frequently within the half period. This is important, and the, the magnitude reduced by half. So what it means is, if we double the period, we see the double the frequency of AN in this uh, envelope. But this envelope, is going to gradually disappear when we extend the period. So it eventually it become a integral. So uh, mathematicians have demonstrated when we take the limit when we let L approach infinity, keep doubling the period until it reaches infinity, we can represent this periodic function in this form, in this integral form. We call it Fourier integral form. Notice the integral is from zero to L, uh, zero to infinity. Um, and also the integrand involve two functions. These are two integrals, a of w and b of w uh, are the two co-options we need to put in to represent this Fourier integral for a given f of x. And uh, uh, I underline the integral limit 
just to alert you that uh, when you take the integration, be careful. Uh, the representation is from zero to infinity, but when you take the coefficients, the integral have to be taken from negative infinity to in infinity. And uh, uh, another thing I want to uh, mention is, naturally you already understand, uh, if we have a special case, if f is even, cosine is an even function. The product of two even functions is an even function. So in that case, we have this integral reduced to double the amount, and then we can integrate from zero to two. Similarly, if f is an odd function, sine is an odd function. Oh, sorry. Um, if f if uh, f is even, sine is an odd function. The product is an odd function. So integrating this integral from negative infinity to infinity, this will reduce to zero because the integrand is an odd function. So this means for an odd, for an even f, we have non-zero a, but we have b of w equal to zero. Similarly, we can say that for an odd f, odd times an even equal to odd, an odd times odd equal to even. So a of even equal to r. So a of w is going to be zero and uh, product of an odd times odd equal to an even function. So uh, bn we can multiply by two and uh, let the integration limit be changed from zero to infinity. And here is what I just discussed. For even f, if f is even, we have bn equal to zero, an reduced to this form, the integral from zero to infinity and the coefficient double. Similarly, for art f, if art, if it is art, then a of w reduced to zero. B, we have to double the amount uh, and we can integrate only from zero to infinity. And then we can look at this example. If uh, between zero to one, the function is fully defined one. And other than this range, the function value is zero all the way from negative in to infinity. Only this range is non-zero. Uh, we can use the Fourier series representation because the given function is even, so we only need to take A of W. B W is equal to zero. And uh, this is a, a straightforward integral. And so the Fourier representation of this given function equal to this form. Now, uh, if uh, we uh, uh, write an equation, essentially this 
equals the functions we discuss like this. We see this function look like this. Uh, notice we do have one more line at x equal to one. We already know from the last lecture that at the discontinuous point, the function value should always be the the average value at the, the discontinuous point. So we can um, say this equals this function like this. This looks like a strange equality, but uh, I do want to mention there are several homework problems I assign involve proof an integral equal to a set of function like this. The way you need to prove is uh, by comparing comparing this with the Fourier integral representation like what we discussed. Look at this, comparing this with this. Then we see that uh, sine term disappear. There's no sine term, no sine of w times o, uh, x. So uh, we know the Fourier representation involve an even function that uh, b of w equal to zero, what do we need to prove is actually this. a of w equal to this uh, for its representation. So uh, every time we see this type of problem in the homework, we need to prove uh, we need to first compare this uh, the Fourier integral representation and uh, eliminate the, and, uh, the absent terms. Then we realize all we need to prove is to prove this remaining factor, which is sine w divided by w equal to a of w. That's all we need to prove after the comparison. Let's look at another example. If uh, we have a given function a uh, f of x equal to e to the minus kx look like this. It's an exponentially decay function. Um, we would like to uh, get its a Fourier Series Fourier integral representation. If we see this kind of uh, problem, we know the other side, the function can be arbitrarily given. So we can use either Fourier uh, series, Fourier uh, even series is a sign integral representation cosine representation or sign representation by assuming f is either even or odd if uh, we take a even representation then b of w equal to zero. Then uh, uh, we get this a equal to this. We use integration by parts. We get these two terms, and then finally we get a of 
W equal to this. Alternatively, if we choose to represent a function by using Fourier cosine representation, that is the odd representation, we can obtain the function by using the similar way. Um, we get this kind of representation. We can also say we can prove the given function, that this is the given function equal to this. So this uh, completes uh, my talk for this section. Next chapter, we're going to start the discussion of partial differential equations.